Herodotus has always played a really important role in my teaching. And I have had many rewarding Herodotus seminars here at Penn over the last several decades. As a result, I've had the privilege of teaching a number of people who have gone on to make significant contributions to Herodotian studies. Um, I first came to the helpline a year ago in order to hear a remarkable paper by Molly Scottheim that had originated in one of my seminars. And among others who have appeared here, I've also taught Ellen Millinder. And I also want to mention Chris Barron, because I suspect um, that a large number of the contributors to his encyclopedia, uh, which Jan just talked about, are here on the screen. I taught Herodotus again this past spring in the semester that is just now coming to a close. And Madlena Scarperi, who will be speaking here in a few weeks, was an essential member of that seminar. And we have already had a preview of her fine upcoming contribution. Over the years, I've had some great visitors to those courses, including my valued neighbor, Rosaria Munson and Carolyn DeWald. And this spring we had Zoom visits from both Joel Schlosser, another neighbor, and Emily Greenwood. And I was able to schedule those so that I could assign their helpline videos as preparation. And that was really terrific. I think the students really appreciated that. Um, and I think they're watching a lot of the videos now. Um, so anyway, discussions that began here could continue in my class. So I'm really pleased to have this chance to participate in the helpline's ongoing exploration of Herodotus's relationship to Sophocles, an author on whom I have done much more work. What I'm gonna offer now is not really a finished paper, but rather some further thoughts on the mysterious symbiosis between these two authors prompted by earlier presentations here on this theme. Francesco Gazzano's discussion of Croesus as both a tragic and an historical figure, Jan Haywood and Doris Post's rich elaboration of the parallels between Croesus and the Oedipus of Oedipus the King, and Charlie Chasen's masterful analysis of Sophoclean elements in Herodotus's account of Periander in book three. The relationship between these two authors is clearly good to think with, even if the puzzle of how to chart that relationship in either personal or literary historical terms will never be solved. And even if there is something ludicrously myopic about the way we conduct this inquiry in ignorance of the vast majority of Sophocles plays. Jan and Doris were studiously non-committal on the question of influence and its possible direction. Charlie was more willing to stick his neck out and to argue that Herodotus was adapting Sophoclean motifs drawn from extant plays in his account of Periander while acknowledging the thorny dating issues that any such argument has to confront. In my case, I'll be starting with affinities that point in the other direction to Sophocles responding to Herodotus because both Francesca's paper and Charlie's topic led for me to Oedipus at Colonus, a play that was certainly composed after the conventionally, although not universally, accepted end of Herodotus's life sometime in the 420s. Charlie's presentation made me look with new eyes at Herodotus's account of Periander. And I was especially struck by one sentence in the long speech that Periander delivers to his son Lycophron in an attempt to overcome Lycophron's hostility. Lycophron has left his father's house out of anger and disgust at Periander's killing of his wife and Lycophron's mother, Melissa, and is living the life of an abject beggar. Periander tries to win him back with an appeal both to the benefits of tyrannical status and to pity for himself. Strikingly, he claims to be deserving of pity while also acknowledging that he did something terrible. And he, in fact, he presents those two factors as congruent. Um, he argues that the deeds that make his son angry at him should actually arouse his sympathy. You are my son and a member of the royal family of the prosperous city of Corinth, but you have chosen the life of a tramp because you are feeling anger and hostility towards me, the person you least ought to treat this way. For if something terrible, tis sumfure, 
has happened to, to make you suspicious of me, remember that it is me that it happened to. It affects me above all because, or to the extent that Hosso, I was the one who did it. In this, Periander is partly echoing Herodotus himself, who introduces the story by labeling the death of Melissa a symphore. Um, after Periander killed his own wife, Melissa, he suffered a further misfortune in addition to the one that had already befallen him. This somewhat counterintuitive idea that performing a horrible crime is in fact a form of suffering deserving of acceptance and sympathy is particularly resonant with what Oedipus says in Oedipus at Colonus when he is trying to win over the citizens of Colonus. Soon after he arrives, he is welcomed by elders, those elders who comprise the chorus. But once they learn his name, they respond in horror and rescind their initial welcome. To which Oedipus replies that they should not reject him on the basis of his name and that what they fear really is only his name, not my body or my deeds, for my deeds have consisted of suffering rather than acting. If I have to speak about my mother and my father, the ones for whom you fear me, this I am sure of. I've given a somewhat normalizing translation of Sophocles' pointedly strained Greek, which literally reads, my deeds suffered rather than acted. But that seems to be the sense that Oedipus is aiming at in a more tightly formulated version of Periander's point that to do something terrible is in fact to suffer misfortune. The paradoxical quality of this claim is somewhat softened by Oedipus's subsequent explanation that his awful deeds were out of his control. They were carried out both in the heat of the moment and inadvertently, since he was reacting to an attack from Laius and he was unaware of Laius and Jocasta's identities. For how can I be evil in nature? I struck back after being struck, so that even if I had acted in full awareness, I could not then have been evil but I arrived where I arrived, not knowing anything. This explanation may also be relevant to Periander, whose killing of Melissa may also have been in the heat of the moment and also inadvertent in the sense that he did not intend to kill her. Herodotus does not specify how Periander killed Melissa, but there is an account in Diogenes Laertius. After some time in a fit of anger, he killed his wife by throwing a footstool at her or by kicking her when she was pregnant, having believed the slanderous tales of concubines whom he afterwards burnt alive. So maybe Periander is to be understood as being like Oedipus, a victim of sumphore in the sense that he committed a crime without intending it and then had to bear the consequences. And while Herodotus does not include um, the story about Periander, it is suggestive that only 20 chapters earlier at 332, he tells a similar story about Cambyses as one of the things that Cambyses did while under the influence of madness. Cambyses became angry at his wife because she hinted at his murder of his brother Smyrdas, and he grew angry and jumped on her when she was pregnant and she miscarried and died. There is also a further similarity in the situations of the two figures. Since Oedipus is here in the process of achieving what Periander a little later in his story attempts but fails to achieve, namely to be accepted as an exile in another city despite his awful reputation. When Lycophron is unmoved by Periander's speech, Periander ships him off to Corsaira, which is part of his sphere of influence. So he doesn't have to go on seeing him. Later on, when he's older, Periander wants Lycophron to come back and take over from him, but Lycophron says he will never return to Corinth while Periander is alive. Periander then offers to change places with Lycophron, but the people of Corsaira really don't want him, and so add to his suffering by killing Lycophron in order to prevent this exchange. There are also some salient differences here. Not only is the would-be exile rejected 
rejected, but Periander is trying to go to a city that is within his sphere of political control rather than to an independent community like Athens. The story is different and being more immediately political in that it reflects in however mythologized a fashion the actual interstate politics of Periander's day. And it's also secular. Periander's crimes lack the divine causation to which Oedipus is able to appeal. And they impart to him none of the special sanctity that makes Oedipus's presence beneficial to Athens. And so makes it worthwhile for the Athenians to overcome their horror at his past actions. This then seems like one of those cases in which there's not necessarily an identifiable illusion or borrowing between two passages, but rather a close affinity between Herodotus's and Sophocles' conceptions of the particular fates of prominent tyrannical figures. An affinity that to echo Jan and Doris feels more pronounced than just shared appeal to a common store of Greek wisdom or set of recurrent story patterns. The specific parallel I've suggested can of course only be compatible with Charlie's analysis of the Periander episode as incorporating and reworking Sophoclean material if one accepts a very late date for the histories. In his presentation, Charlie referred to Homer as the elephant in the room in any discussion of Herodotus and tragedy. Here, I think another elephant in the room might also be pertinent, namely all those other plays of Sophocles that we don't have. If we did, we might well be finding many parallels between them and various passages in the histories. Francesca's presentation also pointed to Oedipus at Colonus, but in a different way. In comparing Croesus and Oedipus, Francesca observed that while both of them suffer a great fall, neither story ends at that point. Both are granted by their authors what Francesca called a second life. Croesus does not die on the pyre and Oedipus does not die at the end of Oedipus the king. She then went on to contrast those second lives and focused on the way that Croesus, as he is depicted living on in the histories, does not acquire the same stature and degree of wisdom that Oedipus does. But by, by evoking Oedipus at Colonus, she also gestured towards the way in which that play represents a particularly Herodotian project in its attention to the effects of a longer span of time than is afforded by the concentrated plot of a single tragedy. By writing a second play about Oedipus that functions as a kind of sequel, Sophocles was able to replicate within the genre of tragedy, something of the longer in episodes that resemble tragedies in form as well as content, as Charlie pointed out in connection with the Periander story. And this also allows fuller, for a fuller account of the variability of fortune over time, which means that even someone who experiences a devastating fall can rise again. The working out of this variable fate for Oedipus is announced with simple clarity by his daughter Ismene when she arrives immediately after Oedipus's encounter with the wary elders of Colonus to bring Oedipus and Antigone news of new oracles about Oedipus and new doings in Thebes. She explains to her father, now the gods are raising you up, but before they destroyed you. That perpetually changing fortune in either direction occurring over time between then and now is of course, reminiscent of Herodotus's key statement. Later in the play, Oedipus himself gives a speech in which he explains to Theseus that change is a perpetual feature of human existence. He makes this point specifically in reference to change in relations between political entities, because he wants Theseus to understand that the present good relations between Athens and Thebes that is to say the state of things in their lifetimes will not last forever. And this resonates with Herodotus's particular interest in the development of enmity, in his case, enmity between East and West, 
as part of the historical process. Given what a Herodotian project this play is, it is therefore not surprising that in the same early section of the play, in which these speeches of Oedipus and Ismene occur, we find one of the two passages in Sophocles that are most widely accepted as manifestly influenced by Herodotus, the other being the passage in Antigone, in which Antigone adopts the argument of the wife of Interfernes, and I will get to that eventually. The arrival of Ismene, who has traveled from home to bring her news out of concern for her father, like that also displayed by Antigone, coupled with the fact that his sons have stayed home in Thebes pursuing their own issues, leads Oedipus to an observ observation that draws on Herodotus's report on Egyptian customs. Oh, those two conform to Egyptian customs in their nature and their way of life. For there, the men sit inside the houses and weave while their wives go out and procure the necessities of life. In your case, my children, the ones who should perform this work are staying home like unmarried girls. And in their place, the two of you assume the miserable burdens of my unhappy state. This is obviously based on Herodotus' account of the complete inversion in Egypt of customs followed elsewhere in which gender reversal plays a large role. Um, there is a direct reference to the first example he cites, which is about gender and space. There the women go into the market and trade and the men stay home and weave. But there's also an implicit reference to a point that Herodotus makes a little later about the gender division of duties towards parents. There is no obligation for sons to take care of their parents if they do not want to, but for daughters, there is every obligation, even if they do not want to, I'm sorry, um, even if they do not want to. So this is not a mysterious underlying affinity. Oedipus is in effect quoting Herodotus. It is as if he's been reading Herodotus or had heard Herodotus speak. And he is even briefly inhabiting a Herodotian persona as he lays out what the Egyptian customs are, a K gar. Laurie Allen Reitzhammer in particular has drawn attention to Oedipus's resemblance to Herodotus and to Herodotus's internal avatar Solon. He is a traveler who has seen many places and developed an informed and privileged perspective on the world. And arriving in the unfamiliar setting of Colonus, he is necessarily involved in learning about local customs. At the same time, Sophocles' dramatization of a tragic hero applying Herodotus to his own circumstances also highlights essential differences. Oedipus is not a detached observer of foreign customs. He is making the painful discovery that those customs map on to the distinctive troubles of his own family. He and his daughters seek instruction about the religious nomoi of Colonus not to provide a report on them to an interested audience, but in order to properly perform necessary rituals of propitiation. And these differences are significantly related to genre. Uh, through his practice of historiae, Herodotus incorporates into his work the figure of the inquirer or the outside observer. He complicates things by blurring the line between that figure and the protagonists of his stories. And here, of course, I'm thinking particularly of those royal inquirers discussed by Matthew Christ. But there are also characters in the histories who are truly detached. Um, for example, Solon, who is completely impervious to the allure of Croesus's glittering wealth. But tragedy revolves around the discovery that what might seem like exotic foreign evils are actually present at the core of its character's own settings within the royal household where personal and private, per personal and public troubles converge. As Herodotus's famous story about Phrynichus's play on the capture of Miletus makes clear, tragedy involves painful exposure to oikeia kaka, internal troubles. But these must not be too immediately evoked. They have to be kept at some protective distance. 
One notable mechanism for that distancing is the one that Froma Zeitlin in particular has called attention to, making plays performed in Athens dramatize myths about Thebans. But the tragic hero himself doesn't have that, doesn't benefit from that protection. Oedipus may be physically in Athens, but he remains himself a Theban and fully invested in the conflicts of the Theban royal family. Um, and, through and throughout tragedy, one of the most consistent markers of internal troubles is gender inversion. What is in Egypt a set of outlandish practices through which social organization mimics topography is in the world of tragedy a sure sign of social breakdown, often of a situation in which men have failed in their responsibilities and so women have to step up and act. We see this pattern mirrored in some of the tragically inflected stories in Herodotus, such as the Gyges story, where the wife of Candaules becomes an actor and a speaker when she is mistreated by her husband, but by no means in all of them. And here I'm thinking particularly of um, Charlie's discussion of the Periander story, where he noted the reverse gender inversion involved in presenting a pair of brothers in ways that recall the pairs of sisters, including Antigone and Ismene, found in Sophocles. I think this discrepancy can also be helpful for thinking about the other, even more famous Sophoclean borrowing from Herodotus, Antigone's application of the argument made by the wife of Interfernes in book three of Herodotus to her own situation in order to explain why she took extraordinary measures to bury her brother. If my husband died, um, there could be another and a child from another man if I lost the first ones, but my mother and father are hidden in Hades. There is no way a new brother could be born. This replicates the argument made by the wife of Interfernes when given the chance by Darius to save one of her condemned male relatives. O oh, king, there would be another husband for me if divine fortune allow allowed it and other children if I lost these. But since my father and mother are no longer alive, another brother could in no way be born. Um, as many people have noted, this exercise in applied Herodotus is much more awkwardly integrated than the one undertaken by Oedipus. Antigone's situation of choosing to bury her one remaining brother is significantly different from that of the wife of Interfernes, who needs to choose one of a number of extant male relatives, including a husband and several sons. Um, that discrepancy can be quite poignant since Antigone will never have the husband or sons she is hypothetically choosing against. And the same can be said of the point at which the two women's situations do converge, which is the fact that their parents are dead. What is for the wife of Interfernes simply a circumstance that factors into her calculation in which we as readers of this brief anecdote take no particular interest is for Antigone an overwhelming preoccupation. The conditions under which her parents died is a source of constant trauma, and the prospect of meeting them in Hades is very much on her mind, as is the prospect of meeting his parents in Hades is also very much on the mind of Oedipus and Oedipus the king. So it's notable that while the wife of Interfernes says that her parents are no longer living, Antigone specifies that they are in Hades. And although she's not as explicit about it, Antigone is like Oedipus in finding in her own life a much more painful personal echo of a circumstance reported by Herodotus. While many episodes in Herodotus are inflected by tragedy, the story of the wife of Interfernes is definitely not one of them. It belongs to a different category, of a different type of story which Herodotus likes to tell. Uh, and these stories have more in common with his ethnographical observations. Um, those are stories in which someone applies a logical cal calculation to a situation that would normally be governed by sentiment. And this is brought out in the question posed by Darius to the wife of Interfernes, um, a question from an inquiring king. 
Uh, he sends messengers to, messengers to ask her why she chose her brother when he was less near, a lotri uteros, than her children, and less dear, Hason Kekaris Menos, than her husband. Such characters may not themselves be investigators like Herodotus himself, but they have affinities to such figures. They approach their own lives with some of the investigators' detachment and reliance on rationality. One prominent example would be the Egyptian king Amasis in his relations with the Samian tyrant Polycrates. When Polycrates, despite his best efforts, fails in his attempt to act on Amasis' advice and reduce his excessive good fortune, Amasis breaks off their friendship um, so that he would not be upset as he would be at the loss of a friend when great and dreadful disaster overcame Polycrates. Amasis proleptically reasons himself out of painful feelings of pity for Polycrates and takes steps that rest on the assumption that an official relationship based on calculation can annul personal feelings of friendship. Amasis's capacity for detachment is related to the fact that he has internalized from the outset the insights that Solon tries to impress on Croesus, but that Croesus tragically learns too late. His initial advice to Polycrates that he needs to become less fortunate is based on his understanding that to theon hos esti phoneron, divinity is full of envy. In the realm of ethnographic reporting rather than storytelling, we see a similar fascination with logical calculation in the place of sentiment in the marriage practices followed by the Babylonians and the Aniti, which Herodotus especially praises. This is a highly efficient auction system by which the money raised in payments for the most attractive women provides dowries for those who are less desirable. This regulation explicitly includes features that, that foreclose typical feelings and personal considerations. Fathers are not allowed to decide who to give their daughters to, and husbands who are induced by a large payment to take on an undesirable bride um, have to pledge that they will live with her as their wife. So to return to Antigone, I would say that she, like Oedipus, dramatizes for us the difference between a systematic observer and theorist of human situations like Herodotus and some of his characters and someone who is unavoidably caught up in personally painful and dangerous transgressive circumstances. And being caught up in those circumstances is not easy to avoid, especially for a member of a royal family as we can see from the way that Antigone and Ismene are drawn into the toxic arena of Theban political conflicts. Another figure who illustrates this is Creon in Oedipus the King, who fends off Oedipus's accusations that he is involved in a power grab by insisting that he has no desire to rule. But his position in the royal household, which tellingly he admits he rather likes for its indirect power, means that even though he is vindicated in his self-defense, he has no choice but to take over and become himself a tragic protagonist. Um, in an article about the end of Trachinii, Pat Easterling makes an important observation about the ways that Sophoclean plays end. At the very end of a play, Sophocles often introduces a glancing reference outside the action, suggesting as it were that there is a future, but this would have to be the subject of a different play. At the end of the Oedipus, of Oedipus the King, we indeed can see a different play taking shape, the Creon, in which Creon has to deal with a civic problem, the problem of Oedipus, and starts things up by sending to Delphi. Easterling's observation is also useful for the point I was making about Oedipus at Colonus, the way that standalone plays can, in relation to each other, capture the longer chains of action and reaction that feature both in Aeschylus's connected trilogies and in the histories. Both Sophocles and Herodotus are committed 
to the tragic insight that it is almost impossible for people not to get drawn into a dynamic that involves action, transgression, and terrible suffering. And they both tell stories about figures like Croesus and Oedipus, whose actions bring about the very misfortunes they are trying to prevent. As one more comparison between Oedipus and Colonus and the histories will illustrate, and this really is just a comparison, even the fundamental human instinct to survive can implicate someone in a tragic scenario. So when Oedipus responds to Creon's bringing up of his old crimes, he makes a defense of his killing of Laius, similar to what he says in the episode I looked at earlier when he tells the chorus that he was reacting to aggression, pathon men antedron. But now he formulates this as a question to Creon. If here and now someone tried to kill you, you who are so righteous, would you inquire whether the killer was your father or would you repay him at once? I think that since you like being alive, you would repay the culprit and not look into the rights and wrongs of it. Turning now to Gyges, a figure with unquestionably tragic affinities, when his assiduous efforts to avoid transgressive actions and with them involvement in the historical process of dynastic change through regicide, when those efforts are unavailing, he too acts just because he wants to stay alive. He gives in when the insistent queen threatens him with her bodyguards and, re and remains unmoved by his entreaties. He could not convince her, but saw that it was truly inescapable that he either kill the king or himself be killed by others. He chose that he would survive. But no one thing, is ever always true of Herodotus. And as I said before, not every scenario in the histories is tragic. A number of the powerful leaders that Herodotus portrays are outliers. They are especially perspicacious, often sharing insights of the historian himself, and somehow exempt from that the fatal desire for more that drives most Herodotian agents. And they are able to step outside the historical process with its relentless dynamic of rising and falling. So I wanna end by suggesting that those figures are portrayed in ways that are appreciably untragic. That is to say that they are described in terms that expressly depart from the paradigms that are shared between tragedy and those parts of the histories that do display notable affinities to tragedy. One is Francesca's example of Croesus during the second life that he undergoes after having been rescued from the pyre. After Croesus has left the main narrative with the end of his rule, which Herodotus marks at 186, specifying its length as 14 years, he makes a series of somewhat ad hoc appearances that don't add up to a coherent presentation. And as Francesca puts it, he just steps out of history without any fanfare. His fall is not followed by a meaningful rise like that of Oedipus. And this is pointed up for us by the ways in which um, Sophocles dramatized that second life in Oedipus at Colonus. Another such figure is Amasis, who is a kind of anti croesus as we can see from Herodotus's description of his death, that all meaningful endpoint. When Cambyses invaded Egypt, he did not find Amasis alive. Amasis had died after ruling for 44 years in which no seriously disastrous thing happened to him. Amasis dies a natural death before he can be defeated and captured by a foreign invader. He has a long rule, 30 years longer than Croesus's, and he experiences no sumphore in his life. As I've already men mentioned, he simply internalizes Solon's understanding of divine phthonos. There's no late learning for him. And he is able to think himself out of the tragic emotion of grief for the troubles of a friend. A further example is the Ethiopian king Sabakos, who occupies Egypt for 50 years and then voluntarily withdraws. Not only is he not driven by the desire for more, but his decision is guided by a dream that he correctly interprets 
and by a completely unambiguous oracle. He has a dream that a man stands over him and commands him to cut all the priests in Egypt in half. But he realizes that this dream is designed to lure him into a tragic pattern of transgressive behavior followed by painful consequences. And that certainly sounds like the oracle that motivates Oedipus's flight from Corinth. And Sabacus recognizes that and is able to resist it. After he had that dream, he said that the gods had sent it as provocation so that having treated the priests sacrilegiously, he would suffer some bad consequence at the hands of either gods or humans. So he would not do those things. But now the amount of time had passed after which it had been foretold that having ruled Egypt for that length of time, he would go away. For when he was in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian's oracle had said that he should rule Egypt for 50 years. Since that amount of time had passed and he was disturbed by the dream, Sabacus voluntarily left Egypt. My last example is Otanes, the Persian conspirator who plays a leading role in the removal of the false Smyrtus, but then steps out of the historical process. He declines to join the competition to be the next king. He brokers a special arrangement by which he and his descendants observe Persian nomoi, but are free of being ruled by others. In the preceding debate, Otanes is the one who expresses the views that are arguably closest to Herodotus's own. Even if, as Ellen Millinder convincingly argued in her presentation, Herodotus is hardly an uncritical proponent of democracy. This seems especially true where Otani's views of the evils of monarchy are concerned. Once he removes himself from the story of dynastic succession, Otanes figures in one other episode and like Croesus, exits the narrative without any explicit notice. So I find the particular way he formulates his aspiration at the moment of his abdication significant. I do not wish to rule or to be ruled. Otanes is renouncing the fundamental dynamic of political power in which ruling and being, and being ruled or acting and being acted upon are two sides of the same coin. This is the same inescapable nexus that Gyges encounters formulated in starker terms of life and death when having been too much ruled by Candoles, his only viable course is to become the ruler. He has to kill or be killed. And that same dynamic is articulated both by Periander and by Oedipus, two tragic tyrants who recognize that doing and suffering are so closely bound up as to be the same thing. So then uh, to conclude, along with all the additional elements in the histories that are simply not particularly tragic, that simply reflect other interests and concerns, there's a distinctly anti-tragic streak that runs along, alongside all of those affinities and shared features that we keep finding more and more of. And this involves a perspective that is to some extent identified with the figure of the historian. And paradoxically, this anti-tragic dimension is especially brought home to us by Sophocles at those moments when his tragic protagonists are most clearly quoting Herodotus. Thank you.